All right, everyone, welcome to week seven. This week we're going to discuss sedimentary rocks, which is chapter seven in your textbooks. And this picture on this first slide here uh, um, is some sandstone um, in New Mexico near one of my field sites um, from when I worked down in New Mexico. So what is the importance of sedimentary rocks? Why does anyone care? Well, firstly, uh, sediments and sedimentary rocks cover approximately 75% of Earth, Earth's surface. So, you know, last week, chemical and physical weathering, talking about how solid rock is broken down into sediments. Well, this week we're going to talk about how sediments can ultimately form sedimentary rocks and um Physical and chemical weathering and the formation of sedimentary rocks are both extremely important processes because such a high percentage of the surface of the earth is covered with sediments and sedimentary rocks. Um, in terms of percentage, uh, sedimentary rocks comprise about 5% by volume of earth's outermost 10 miles. Um, the reason why the volume of sedimentary rocks uh, within the Earth's outermost 10 miles is so much lower than the percent of the Earth that's covered by sedimentary rocks is because most sedimentary rocks are located near the surface. And we'll get into reasons why that is the case next week. Um, also, sedimentary rocks are very important because they contain evidence of past environments so characteristics of sedimentary rocks, both physical and chemical characteristics, can tell you about Earth's history. And lastly, sedimentary rocks are an important resource. Um, they uh, often contain coal, oil, and other fossil fuels. And they also contain groundwater resources and can uh, read readily transmit groundwater in some cases for water users and um, in some areas to bolster stream flow where there is a substantial groundwater reservoir adjacent to streams. So where do sedimentary rocks come from? Um, well, sedimentary rocks are the products of mechanical and chemical weathering. Uh, Sediments and soils are those products, but then sedimentary rocks are a further evolution of that weathering. So sediments and soluble constituents are typically transported downslope by gravity. Um, soluble constituents meaning basically if you dissolve part of a rock um, chemically and then it's transported downslope. And then those sediments are then deposited and subsequently buried by more sediments that layer on top of them. And as this deposition of sediment continues, ultimately the sediments are lithified into sedimentary rocks. And we'll talk about how that process occurs throughout this lecture. But these processes yield three major types of sedimentary rocks. And you'll learn to identify all of these in lab um, with Jeff's help. And those three types are detrital, chemical, and organic sedimentary rocks. So det detrital sedimentary rocks form from sediments that have been weathered and transported. Um, the chief constituents of detrital rocks include clay minerals, quartz, feldspars, and micas. And the particle size is used to distinguish among the various rock types within the detrital sedimentary rock category. Um, so you can think of these rocks as basically, you know, pieces of other rocks that were mechanic or were physically or chemically weathered then are deposited somewhere and then buried and 
then they lithify into detrital sedimentary rocks. Now in this figure, you can see a diagram showing how detrital set sedimentary rocks are classified based off of particle size. So you can see um, that in the, in the top of top section of this figure, you have a conglomerate and breccia, which can contain particle sizes anywhere from a granule, which is two to four millimeters in diameter, to a boulder, which is greater than 256 millimeters in diameter. And particle sizes within that range of sizes are lithified together to form conglomerates and breccias. The difference between conglomerate and breccia is that conglomerates are basically rounded particles um, lithified together versus breccia are angular particles of rock uh, lithified together. The next major type of detrital sedimentary rock is sandstone. And this is when the size of particles is between 1 16th and two millimeters. Um, for those of you who have ever walked on a beach um, or been in the middle of a desert, you are usually walking on sand-sized particles. And if those sand-sized particles get buried, then they often become lithified into sandstone. And then lastly, on the smaller end of particle size, if the majority of the particle sizes are silt, which is 1 256th to 1 16th millimeters to clay, which is less than 1 256th millimeter, then you are left with either shale or mudstone or siltstone as your most common types of detrital sedimentary rocks there. So we should probably talk about shale um, specifically because this is an extremely common detrital sedimentary rock um, that you will probably see throughout your travels. Um, as mentioned on the previous slide, it's formed from silt and clay sized particles. And shale forms from the gradual settling of sediments in quiet, non turbulent environments. So you can think of that as maybe like a wetland um, or the bottom of a of the middle of a lake, um, for example. And the reason why, and this is this is a really important thing to note about you know the formation of different types of sedimentary rocks and how they inform you about the history of the earth. The reason why shale forms in these areas where there's gradual settling of sediments in quiet, non-turbulent environments is because in a low energy environment it's easier for such small particles like silt and clay to actually settle out of suspension. So in a higher energy environment, silt and clay will be suspended within the water column or suspended within the atmosphere as they're getting blown around by the wind. For example, it's only these low energy environments that allow these particles to settle out and ultimately form shale um, or clay stone or siltstone. In shale, the silt and clay sized particles form into thin layers that are called laminae. And shale has what's known as facility, which means that that rock can be split into thin layers um, by those laminae. Uh, it typically crumbles easily and tends to form gentle slopes um, in the natural world because of that. And um, it is the most abundant type of sedimentary rock. One thing that's really important about shale, which is sort of displayed in this figure here, is that shale is one of the most common ways in which 
organisms are fossilized. Um, so any situation in which a plant or animal might become trapped by mud, essentially, silt and clay, then that organism will often, under the right conditions, become fossilized. And this is why um, shale beds are some of the most amazing collections of fossils in the world and can really help to inform us about Earth's history, um, specifically what has lived on Earth before humans. Another really popular and important type of sedimentary rock is uh, of detrital sedimentary rock is sandstone. Um, and as I sort of previously talked a, a little bit about, it's made of sand-sized particles. Um, sandstone can form in a variety of environments. Um, it is the second most abundant sedimentary rock. And quartz is the most abundant mineral in sandstones. So most sandstone is known as quartz sandstone because it's predominantly quartz. Um, Arcos sandstone uh, contains a fair amount of feldspar in addition to quartz. And then gray wacky sandstone contains rock fragments um, and matrix in addition to quartz and sandstone. So this is a picture here of uh, a quartz sandstone. You may note that the there's a kind of a wide variety of colors in this quartz sandstone. And as we talked about in the mineral lecture, that's actually because quartz, quartz's color changes pretty easily, easily from just small changes in its chemical composition, which can be caused by things like water flowing through this at one point in time and interacting with the chemical makeup of the quartz. And then this is a nice example of gray wacky, which uh, conveniently enough for when you're trying to identify this detrital sedimentary rock um, is gray. And as I mentioned before, um, it's generally characterized by not, not only being gray, but also sort of having poorly sorted angular grains of quartz, feldspar, and other small rock, rock fragments. Um, so different characteristics about the particles within different types of sandstone can tell us different things about Earth's history and what geological processes occurred to ultimately form that sandstone. And as we've learned from talking about quartz sandstone and arcos and gray wacky, the particles in sandstone um, do vary and they can be classified by their sorting and shape, which that classification scheme allows us to learn more about what happened to form them. So sorting is the degree of similarity in particle size in a sedimentary rock. For example, if all the grains in a rock are of very similar size, then that rock is known as well sorted. If the grains in a rock are different sizes, both large and small, then that rock is called poorly sorted. And the level of sorting can help us to determine what the depositional environment was when that rock was formed. For example, if you have a well-sorted rock, then that general, generally means that the sediment that formed that rock had a long travel time to arrive where it was ultimately deposited and then lithified. So something that would create a well-sorted sedimentary rock is uh, wind transport. Alternatively, something more moderately sorted or a moderate travel time is um, wave transported sand. And then lastly, a poorly sorted or short travel time might be 
stream transported sand um, because in the case of a stream its total travel time from when it was physically or um, chemically weathered from its parent material to when it was deposited is less than on average how long it takes for like wind transportation of sand or wave transportation of sand to lead those particles to their ultimate resting place before they form a sedimentary rock. Um, the other characteristic of the particles in sandstone that can tell us more about Earth's history are the particle shape. And particle shape varies from rounded to angular. And the degree of rounding is indicative of how far the sediments have been transported. Um, so for example, if the particles are pretty rounded, then usually they have been transported a far distance from where they originally weathered from. And you can tell that because to round particles, basically you're eroding away the sharp edges of the particles during that transport process. Alternatively, if you have more angular particles in your sedimentary rock, then those particles may have been transported from a nearby source. Um, so an example of a process like this might be uh, that a glacier um, moved those particles from its original source to its resting place where it formed into a rock. So this um, figure here shows both particle sorting um, and particle shape and how going from poorly sorted to well sorted or going from angular shape to rounded is related to the length of travel time as well as the processes that led to those particles being transported. Another common type of detrital sedimentary rock um, that I mentioned earlier are conglomerate and breccia. So again, con conglomerates consist of rounded, usually gravel-sized sediments, although um, that can vary as long as the particle size is larger than sand. And then breccia consists of angular, usually gravel sized sediments, although again, the size of the sediments can vary as long as they're larger than sand. And both of these types of rocks are poorly sorted. So for both conglomerate and breccia, uh, the length of travel from when those particles were eroded from their original material to when they were deposited and lithified into conglomerate and breccia is a short travel time. And this photo here uh, shows both a conglomerate and a breccia. Um, can you tell me which one is a conglomerate and which one is a breccia? I'll give you a second to think about that. So the rock on the left is a conglomerate and you can see that the particles are usually gravel size but they vary in size and they vary in color so there are different types of rocks and then they're cemented together by a matrix that looks sort of yellowish in color and then on the right the breccia you can see the angular rock fragments that are light gray in color and they are lithified um, together with a matrix that is a darker color. The color of the matrix and the material that makes up the matrix that cements or lithifies particles together in sedimentary rocks varies between sedimentary rocks, and we'll talk about that later in this lecture. Okay, so moving on from detrital sedimentary rocks to chemical sedimentary rocks. If you might 
as you might imagine, you know, detrital sedimentary rocks, their source material a lot of times was um, weathered uh, from the parent rock using or by physical um, weathering versus in chemical sedimentary rocks, usually the material was weathered from the parent rock um, by primarily chemical weathering. And chemical sedimentary rocks typically form from, because of that, chemical sedimentary rocks typically form from precipitated material that was once dissolved in solution. Um, so usually um, material that was dissolved in water uh, most commonly. And the reason why the materials that were dissolved by water ultimately precipitate out of that water and form into chemical sedimentary rocks um, is that sometimes inorganic processes such as evaporation occur. So an evaporation occurs and you increase the concentration of the uh, the material dissolved in solution relative to water, eventually it reaches a point where it starts to form um, crystals and ultimately um, chemi a chemical sedimentary rock. And then also you may have organic processes from water dwelling organisms that form biochemical sedimentary rocks. Um, so one common example of this are sea creatures that have shells um, like oysters or clams, for example, and those shells um, can be weathered, chemically weathered, and then ultimately precipitate out of solution or out of that water in certain um, conditions. So this uh, chart shows examples of different um, types of mineralization and different types of organisms that can ultimately create those minerals and those chemical sedimentary, biochemical sedimentary rocks that form from those minerals. Um, I encourage you to look into your textbook a little bit more uh, to study this, but it's really interesting um, how many different types of organisms can create biochemical minerals um, such as calcium carbonate, uh, which can be calcite or, or aragonite, and then silica and apatite as well. One of the chemical sedimentary rocks that forms from um, calcite and aragonite is limestone. And this is actually the most common, most abundant chemical sedimentary rock. Um, it's mainly composed of the mineral calcite. That's the most common uh, mineral for limestone rather than aragonite. And interestingly, it can form from both inorganic chemical origins and organic biochemical biochemical origins, which gives us different types of limestone. So as I sort of alluded to briefly before, biochemical limestone originates from the shells of marine organisms. Um, large quantities of marine limestone are formed from corals, for example, um, so corals secrete a calcium carbonate skeleton and create reefs. So if you've heard of, for example, Australia's Great Barrier Reef, um, that is the second largest coral reef on Earth. Um, coquina, which is a specific type of uh, sedimentary rock that you will learn to identify in lab, is composed of cemented fragments of shell material. And um, chalk, another sedimentary rock that you'll identify in lab, is composed of microscopic marine organisms.
So this um, diagram here shows where the Great Barrier Reef is um, adjacent to Australia, so sort of like adjacent to northeastern Australia. And you can see an aerial photograph of this reef, um, which extends for more than 2,600 kilometers. And then if you look um, at the Guadalupe Mountains um, in Texas, you can see sort of the exposure of a small portion of an ancient reef complex. Um, and so this is sort of like the evolution from a barrier reef to ultimately um, sedimentary rocks exposed at Earth's surface. And then this uh, photograph here is shows a beach with a bunch of seashells deposited on it, deposited on it, and then you can see that if those seashells become buried and lithified, they can ultimately come to form the sedimentary rock coquina, which, as I mentioned previously, is just basically a bunch of seashell fragments cemented together. And then this photo here um, shows. Uh, the white chalk cliffs and um, you know chalk is a biochemical limestone made up um, almost entirely of the tiny hard parts of microscopic marine organisms and um, on the bottom left you can see sort of a, a magnified um, coccolithophorus so in this case a bunch of these microscopic organisms are coccolithophorus, and um, they are basically a one-celled marine uh, plankton that live in large numbers throughout the ocean. So we've talked about um, organic limestone mostly thus far. Um, but how does inorganic limestone form? Well, it forms when chemical changes increase the calcium carbonate content of the water until it precipitates out of solution. Um, so for example, travertine is a type of limestone that's often found in caves and it's formed when um, it uh, precipitates out of the water in the cave as a result of that water losing carbon dioxide to uh, the atmosphere. And then um, oolitic limestone is composed of small spherical grains called ooids, and these ooids form as sort of tiny seeds um, roll in roll around on in shallow marine water uh, that is super saturated with calcium carbonate. So you might have a small particle basically rolling around and then the super saturated calcium carbonate continues to bond to that seed and grow these little ooids. Um, and you'll, you'll get to see both travertine and oolitic limestone in lab as well. This slide just shows um, what the ooids within oolitic limestone look like. So if you were to zoom in on the individual ooids that are formed by chemical precipitation of calcium carbonate around a tiny, a tiny particle, uh, this is what it looks like up next to a dime to give you scale. And then down below in this figure, it shows you what the larger body of oolitic limestone looks like. A couple other important types of chemical sedimentary rocks are dolostone and shirt. So dolostone is similar to limestone, um, but it's not composed of calcium carbonate alone. It also contains magnesium. And this forms uh, most often when magnesium rich waters circulate through limestone. So why would you have magnesium rich waters? Well, for example, if you have 
a mafic igneous rock like let's say basalt for example if you remember mafic igneous rocks have a fair amount of magnesium and iron and so when water infiltrates through basalt it dissolves a certain amount of magnesium in a solution and then when that water ultimately enters into limestone it can form dolostone by adding magnesium to that calcium carbonate base and then shirt is um, really just microcrystalline quartz and it forms when dissolved silica precipitates out of solution. So if you have a quartz sandstone, for example, and water is infiltrating through that quartz sandstone, then it will dissolve some silica into solution. And then that silica may ultimately precipitate out when it becomes saturated in that solution. Um, forming the chemical sedimentary rock shirt. So this is um, what shirt looks like. Uh, you may have heard of um, agate or flint or jasper before and those are specific types of uh, shirt and Similar to quartz, you can see that the color of shirt varies drastically from specimen to specimen, again, because just a slight variation in the chemical composition can change the color by a lot. Um, also, a lot of instances of petrified wood um, are actually where you have, uh, you know, the biological material that makes up the wood being replaced by silica um, and forming uh, and, and, and fossilizing that biological material or, or mimicking its original structure. What's pretty amazing about that is you basically have silica replacing the biological structure that previously existed. So you can still see tree rings a lot of times, for example, or burn scars. So you can um, you can determine some things about the history of the earth based off petrified wood because of that. Um, for those of you familiar with flint, uh, when it's struck against steel, it produces sparks. Um, so it's like a common substance used for starting fires. Um, and there's a description of exactly how that works on this slide. Um, another important and prevalent type of chemical sedimentary rocks are evaporites. And evaporites form when, a lot of times, when restricted seaways become oversaturated and then salt deposition starts. In this case, if a seaway was oversaturated with salt. Um, rock salt and rock gypsum are two of the most common types of evaporites. And occasionally evaporites also form on salt flats uh, when dissolved materials are precipitated as a white crust on the ground. Um, so you can think of Salt Lake, uh, Great Salt Lake down in Utah as an example of that happening on the salt flats there. And speaking of that, um, this slide sort of zooms into Salt Lake and um, the Salt Lake area and the Bonneville Salt Flats. And um, for many years, these flats have been used for very fast cars. So a lot of times when the land speed record is broken, it's actually on these salt flats because they are extremely flat and they're very expansive. So um, you know, a 30,000 acre expanse gives you a lot of time to build up speed when the surface that you're driving on is very flat. Um, and this is sort of a picture of what, what the Bonneville salt flats look like. Um, on to um, organic sedimentary rocks. Um, these form from 
the carbon rich remains of organisms. So, for example, occasionally plant structures like leaves, bark, and wood are identifiable in coal, and that's because coal actually forms from these plant structures that are carbon rich. So there are multiple stages um, in the formation of coal from plant remains. First you have the accumulation of plant remains, and then you have the form formation of peat. Um, as those plant remains start to become lithified, and then you have the formation of lignite and bituminous coal. So if you were to burn coal for any reason, lignite is considered the lowest grade and bituminous is considered the um, a slightly higher grade coal in that the amount of energy that you get from burning it is greater using bituminous coal than it is lignite. And then finally, um, you can have formation of anthracite coal, which is the highest grade coal um, and is gives you the most energy when you burn it. Um, it's sort of the most dense and pure form of coal. So this diagram here shows, you know, a good example of what I was just talking about. So maybe you originally have a swamp environment and then biological material gets buried and partially altered because of that burial and it starts to lithify. Um, plant material starts to lithify to other plant material and that forms peat. And then if it gets buried deeper down in the earth, then it starts to form into lignite, which is a soft um, brown coal. And then if it gets buried even deeper, then it can form a bituminous coal, which is still um, rather soft, but typically looks like a more black colored coal. And then finally, if it gets buried really deep, it can form the highest grade coal, which is anthracite, which is a very hard and black coal. All right, so we've talked about lithification a lot to get to this point. Um, however, lithification is not the only change that occurs to sediment after it's deposited. And before we get into other sorts of changes that take place, I think it's important to really define lithification. So lithification is really just when un uh, a, a term to refer to when unconsolidated sediments are transformed into sedimentary rocks. Um, and that is done through compact compaction and cementation. So compaction is when sediments are buried. The weight of the overlying material from sediments compresses the deeper sediments and sort of packs them in. And then cementation involves the crystallization of minerals among the individual sediment grains. And so this is the process that really glues together the sediments that have been compacted together into one another. Another change that occurs after sediment is deposited is known as diagenesis. And this is when the chemical, physical, and biological changes that take place after sediments are deposited and buried. This usually occurs within the upper few kilometers of Earth's crust, so pretty close to Earth's surface. And an example of this is recrystallization of more stable minerals from less stable ones. For example, the mineral aragonite may um, recrystallize into calcite um, as part of diagenesis. And then calcite, and that's the reason why calcite is included in more sedimentary rocks than aragonite is.
So there are three sort of broad categories of sedimentary environments or areas where sediment is accumulating and forming sedimentary rocks on average. Um, so there's continental, marine, and then transition sedimentary environments. And we'll talk about each of these in greater detail. So continental environments, um, sedimentary environments are dominated by stream erosion or also known as fluvial erosion and deposition. Um, streams really are the dominant agent of landscape alteration. I think any time that you go for a flight or go for a drive or walk down to your local stream um, that runs through a town that you live in or what have you, you'll notice that streams really reshape the landscape in remarkable ways. And this is pretty consistent throughout um, all of the continents and, and islands and land masses on Earth. Another continental um, <clears throat> depositional environment that's really important is uh, glacial. So glacial deposits are typically unsorted mixtures of sediments that range from clay to boulder sized. And if you, if you think about glaciers and how they move down slope, there's a reason why um, glacial deposits are unsorted mixtures of sediments. And that's because glaciers are very powerful and don't necessarily discriminate on what type of sediment they can move, which is why the sediment can be anywhere from clay, very small, to boulder size. And this is much different from streams where basically the rate of flow of the stream determines how big of sediment it can move, right? If you have a stream that's flowing at 100 cubic feet per second, maybe it can move sand. But if that same stream is flowing at 10,000 cubic feet per second, Maybe it could move gravel or cobbles or what have you. And then um, another type of continental depositional environment is wind, also known as aeolian. And this usually leads to well-sorted fine sediments. And in this case, the sediments are well-sorted because they usually have a long travel time, as we discussed previously in this lecture. And the sediments are usually fine because wind usually isn't consistently that powerful. So for example, water on a stream can move larger sediments than wind usually, and glaciers can move larger sediments than either water in a stream or wind. Okay, so moving on from continental sedimentary environments to marine sedimentary environments. Um, and interestingly enough, I'm delivering this lecture to you from Capital City on the Oregon coast. So I'm sort of looking out a window at a marine depositional environment as I present this to you. Um, so a shallow marine sedimentary environment is um, basically anything less than 200 meters deep. And these environments typically border the world's continents. So anywhere you see a continent, there's usually a continental shelf that yields a shallow marine sedimentary environment. And these areas re receive huge quantities of terrestrial or land-based sediments. And the reason for this is be, uh, due to fluvial or stream-based erosion, um, where streams on the continents transport sediment out to sea, and then that sediment is largely deposited near the continents. Because once you get pretty far out to sea, water is not moving fast enough and doesn't have high enough energy to continue to transport something like sand, for example. Um, also, warm seas with minimal terrestrial sediments have usually have carbonate-rich muds. Um, due to the biological activity in those warm seas. And so those shallow marine environments form a lot of limestone, for example. Alternative to a shallow marine environment, a deep marine environment, um, deeper than 200 meters, uh, typically, is further out to sea beyond the continental shelves. 
and in this area it's primarily fine sediments that accumulate on the ocean floor and again this is because anything sand size or or larger probably settled out of the ocean on the continental shelf before it makes it to the deep marine environment because again there's not enough energy and the water's not moving fast enough to continue to carry those large sediments so the only thing that's left is silt and clay that is deposited on the ocean floor in the deep marine environment. Um, turbidity currents are sort of an exception to this because turbidity currents um, can have the energy and power to carry larger sediments out into the deeper sea. But the vast majority of the time, it's just silt and clay being deposited out there. Okay, so we talked about um, continental sedimentary environments and um, marine sedimentary environments, so now transitional environments. So this is really the transition zone between continental sedimentary environments and um, marine sedimentary environments. So the transition zone is um, really the, the shoreline or the beach. Um, examples other than beaches include tidal flats, lagoons, which are shallow bodies of water that are separated from the larger body of water or the ocean by barrier islands or reefs, and then deltas, which are areas where a river is draining into the ocean and a bunch of sand is deposited as um, at the delta. So this figure shows a pretty common example of sedimentary in um, facies in a shallow marine environment. Um, so for example, you have sandstone facies near the beach because generally sand is um, being deposited near the shoreline because the deeper ocean doesn't have enough energy and water's not moving fast enough to continue to transport sand. Then further out into the ocean, you might have a shale facies. And this is because when you get further out into the ocean, um, finally the water is moving slowly enough and has a low enough like overall energy that silt and clay start to fall out and be deposited and form shale. And then you might get further out into the ocean uh, yet and have limestone facies. And this is just due to, um, for example, biological life producing calcium carbonate. And then that calcium carbonate uh, getting deposited and buried and ultimately forming limestone out in the deeper sea. Uh, moving on from facies, um, sedimentary structures are another thing that provide additional information that's useful in the interpretation of Earth's history. So different types of sedimentary structures include um, strata or beds, which are the layers of sedimentary rocks, and also bedding planes um, that 
separate strata or beds. So this photo is an example of sedimentary strata, so it's very clear that there are multiple layers of rock, and those layers may be separated um, because you might have small differences in the type of sediment that was originally being deposited at this location, or maybe you had a depositional environment followed by an erosional environment, and then you had a depositional environment again that was depositing a slightly different um, type of sediment, for example. Another type of sedimentary structure includes, uh, or is cross-bedding. And cross-bedding occurs when the layers, or beds, or strata, in the sedimentary rock are inclined or at a slope. Um, Cross-bedding sedimentary structures are characteristic of sand dunes, deltas, and some stream deposits. And this is because sand dunes and deltas have a slope, and some stream deposits can have a slope as well. So this figure shows a really great example of cross-bedding um, and what cross-bedding looks like from sand dunes. So you can see that over time you have multiple strata or beds that have um, that have different slopes, and the reason for this is because you know the location of sand dunes and the slope of sand dunes changes over time, and so if you have sand dunes that are getting buried deeper and deeper in the earth, then you'll be able to see sort of over time how the structure of that sand dune changed, or if maybe a different sand dune um, came to replace the old sand dune. Um, this is really common in the Navajo sandstone, which you can see if you've ever gone to Utah and explored, for example, the Capitol Reef area, and um, it's pretty, pretty amazing to look at. Another common type of sedimentary structure are graded beds. And these um, arise from a unique situation where the sediments in a strata gradually change from coarse at the bottom to fine at the top. And these are often associated with turbidity currents. And the reason why is because coarse sediments or larger sediments would fall out of suspension first in a turbidity current, whereas the finer sediments would fall out last. Um, and just some context for turbidity currents, since I've talked about them a couple times. What they are are basically rapidly moving sediment-laden water moving down a slope through water or another fluid. So this shows um, an example of how graded um, bedding would occur in the real world. So you can see the continental shelf here right next to this continent in this figure. And then further seaward from the continental shelf, you have a couple of um, submarine canyons. And through those canyons, you have basically a turbidity current that's moving sediment further out to sea and has these deep sea fluvial fans um, that form. And um, as a result of that uh, turbidity current that is forming these um, deep sea fans, uh, within the turbidity current, whenever that sediment is being deposited, you have the coarse particles settling out first and the fine particles settling out last, um, as I sort of previously described on the last slide. Other important sedimentary features to note um, include ripple marks, which are small waves that are lithified in the sedimentary rocks. Um, there are two types of uh, ripple marks. If they're asymmetric, then they're ripple marks that were created by currents in the water that had one primary direction of flow, maybe a stream, for example. Or if they're symmetric, um, then maybe they're, 
than their oscillation ripple marks. So you might think of that as something that um, might be formed on the seashore where you have waves coming in and out. Uh, mud cracks are another type of sedimentary feature, and mud cracks indicate sediments um, formed in an alternatively wet and dry environment. So you have expansion when the sediment is wetted and then contraction when the sediment is dried, and then it leaves um, mud cracks in that sediment. And then finally, fossils um, are the remains of prehistoric life, and fossils oftentimes are found in sedimentary rocks because you can end up burying biological life with sediments, and then when those sediments form into sedimentary rocks, it preserves evidence of that life. And so here um, on the far left, you can see examples of um, ripple marks. And then in the center, you can see examples of mud cracks. And then on the right, you can see examples of um, dinosaur tracks and a trilobite, which are uh, a couple of different types of fossils. So one last thing that is really important to talk about um, in relation to sedimentary rocks is the relationship between sediments, sedimentary rocks, and carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is one of the most active parts of the carbon cycle, or the way that carbon moves through Earth's systems. And one way that you can think of this is that plants absorb CO2 from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. And when plants die, some of the CO2 that they absorbed is deposited into the sediments. And then over time, considerable, considerable amounts of the plant biomass from um, those, or considerable amounts of the plant biomass that was absorbed into the soils is converted into fossil fuels. And then when fossil fuels are burned by humans, that CO2 is released back to the atmosphere or alternatively, if those fossil fuels are um, exposed to the atmosphere and then um, some of the CO2 can be released in that way as well. And this figure just shows a really great example of the carbon cycle as it relates to sedimentary rocks um, and how carbon um, cycles through our systems. So I encourage you to take a minute to look at this figure and think about all of these processes and do some more reading about this in your textbook. And that concludes this week's lecture. Um, as always, please let me know if you have any questions. I'll have office hours on Wednesday. And good luck with your exams this week. Um, and let me know if you have any questions about that. Have a great week.